It's 4 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday, October 2nd. And as of this very moment, Devontae Adams remains a Raider. How much longer does that last? And where potentially could Adams land next? We will give you the latest. Vikings defensive coordinator Brian Flores said this week he's looking forward to seeing Big Ben in London. Turns out, though, that's not the quarterback. It's actually Aaron Rodgers. How's that knee feeling? Well, not good enough for Rodgers to be a full participant in practice. The latest on that injury and all things Jets. We got a very special guest tonight, a guy who pretty much does it all for that Texans defense. How does Jalen Petrie envision slowing down Josh Allen and that Bills defense? Presumably, he looked at the Ravens defense for a few ideas. Welcome inside with the insiders, along with Ian Rappaport, Judy Batista, Mike Garofolo. I am Tom Pellicero. We got a lot going on, guys, around the NFL, but we start once again today in Las Vegas, where, yes, Devontae Adams still there. He was in the facility earlier today rehabbing a hamstring injury that, as we mentioned yesterday, is expected to keep him out for at least this coming week's game. A lot of questions surrounding the future of Devontae Adams as the Raiders mull potential trade opportunities. All the while, Antonio Pierce is trying to get his team ready to go to Denver and take on the Broncos. Is it a distraction, AP? So I get paid here to, to get ready each and every week for the opponent. Um, I don't blink. I don't flinch. I don't know. I've said it before. Like I've been through enough of my life with adversity and stuff that it doesn't bother me. I just move forward. The next obstacle in front of me is the Denver Broncos. And that's what I presented to my team, and that's what they're doing right now in the meeting. We're about to go out to practice and do it versus the Broncos. Get the sense that they absorb that message? 100%. Yeah, no, nah, we got to focus on the task at hand with who we have here. You know, obviously everybody understands Devontae's situation, and, uh, you know, we all love Devontae. But understand he's got to make the best decision for him. Our team has to make the best decision for us. And uh, we got to keep moving forward and trying to figure out how to win games. No matter what, how that turns out, you guys, you know, got a vision of what life might be without him. Sunday and it didn't look too bad actually uh, how much does that help like you know you saw what that looked like yeah I don't know man I, those aren't decisions I have anything to do with you know I trust our guys to make the best decisions for the team and for whoever we have here we're going to give it everything we have and continue to try to win certainly some unique circumstances surrounding this one Ian including an accidentally liked Instagram post that helped bring this to the forefront of the public consciousness but what we know about Devontae Adams right now is he is told, as you and Mike told us yesterday, that he would prefer a trade someplace else. The Raiders have engaged in trade calls with several different teams. I haven't gotten the sense that we are coming to a head immediately, like before the show ends. So that would be great. Let's get this one off the docket. But certainly all signs still point toward this being a realistic possibility. Devontae Adams could be suiting up someplace else sooner than later. Yeah, there are several factors, Tom, that are stacking up to stop this trade from happening this week. Like, if the trade happens, obviously there are scenarios where Devontae Adams walk back, walks back into the Raiders' office and says, you know what, this team is good. I want to be a part of it. I want to keep going here. But for the foreseeable future, until that changes, we are going to go forward with Devontae Adams wanting to be traded. Uh, and yes, I don't believe it is going to happen this week. First of all, he's not healthy. He is still nursing hamstring injury that, as we've talked about, obviously not going to play this week. Wouldn't be surprised if we didn't see the field again until the situation is at least resolved in some form or fashion, whether that's a trade, whether it's him getting back in the fold or however. We know there are several teams interested. Obviously, a couple of his own quarterbacks are. We know that Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets are for sure interested. They're one of the teams that called in the offseason. The New Orleans Saints in the past have called about potentially trading for Devontae. Last year, when everyone thought he was going to be traded, they're one of the teams as well. The Pittsburgh Steelers have been in the market for a receiver. Wouldn't be surprised if they are in the mix. The Baltimore Ravens always looking for a receiver. Would be a tighter cap fit, but certainly something they could make that work. 49ers who have yet to activate uh, Ricky Pearsall, their rookie, would be another one to potentially consider. They are going to have a market. It sounds like the Raiders, Mike, are going to want a lot, and they should. Devontae Adams is a very, very good player suddenly available in the middle of the season. Yeah. I wasn't telling you to wrap it up. I was saying keep going. Like, you can keep naming teams because there's a lot of teams that certainly would have yeah. interest. The question is, yeah, the, well, no, I, I wouldn't wrap him. People wrap me sometimes. I don't like that. So why would I do it to him? Uh, speaking of which, I'm going to get wrapped shortly because I'm taking too long here. Um, so there's the who – 
We can name all those teams. And then there's the when. Like, how quickly is this going to happen? Because we've got that trade deadline off in the distance, uh, which is in the first week of November, as we've talked about repeatedly. I, I don't think we get close to there. I think it's done well before there. I think, Ian, you said nothing this week. I think next week is like the hot zone for this to get done. I really do. Um, so right now the Raiders are canvassing the market, uh, trying to see what the interest is out there, which there is plenty, and then trying to see what the prices that teams are going to be willing to meet. And you know, a lot of times something like this, something happens over the weekend in one of the games, and that spurs some action, whether it's an injury or just a team saying, you know what, we need this guy. we got to pay more than we want. Whatever. Let's see what's hap what happens. I will just say this with regard to the Jets. How many years does Aaron Rodgers have left? Like, it's a great idea. Like, he's going to go reunite with Aaron Rodgers. But Devontae Adams is going to be playing more years than uh, Aaron Rodgers. Got. And then what happens when Rodgers leaves? Is there now another quarterback situation that he's not going to be happy with? So that is a factor at play here, Judy. I, yeah, let's not get too ahead of ourselves. I just want to take you back to the summer. I think it was at a golf tournament when Aaron Rodgers said, I love Devontae Adams. I can't wait to play with him again. Okay, that's why the Jets would be involved in this. Forget about who the quarterback is two years from now. For the Jets, they are in win-right-now mode. You've got Aaron Rodgers this year and we think next year, and then that's probably the end of the road with Aaron Rodgers. They're trying to win a Super Bowl. They have paid Mike Williams. Um, they have paid Alan Lazard. I believe they're both making $10 million this year. They can get this done Obviously, they would have to adjust the contract somehow with Devontae Adams. But I, I feel like this is a situation we know that the Jets were interested in the offseason. And I feel like this is a situation that if they don't get this deal done, the question then that is going to hover over this team, especially while the offense is not coming together yet, is why didn't you get this done? This was an opportunity. You know Rodgers wants it. This is a plug-and-play player. He is familiar with Hackett. He's obviously very familiar with Rodgers. This would be the kind of thing that the Jets would have to answer an awful lot of questions about if it does not come together, and as you pointed out, in the next true. week or so. And the key thing you just said right there, Judy, is Rodgers wants it. When you have a limited type of window with a four-time NFL MVP quarterback, that voice, which, remember, Aaron always wanted in Green Bay to a greater extent than he felt like for a long time he had it, is one that you're going to take into account as they have with a variety of other things. But the contract also, beyond the fact that he's making basically a million dollars a week right now, remember that deal when it was initially done with the Raiders had two effectively dummy years on the end. So his salary is supposed to spike upwards of $36 million each of the next two years. Whatever team gets them, they're either releasing them after the season or they're reworking that contract. You have the hamstring injury that he's still going through, which is a legit injury. This is not a made-up injury. For Devontae Adams, there's also consequences like the fact that you're going to get taxed a lot more by moving to the New York, New Jersey area than you are <laughs> in Las Vegas right now. But that certainly seems like that is a trade-off that he is willing to accept. Will he get his Mike way and be sent to the Jets? I don't sense that the Raiders right now are going to jump out and simply take the best offer just because that's the place Devontae Adams wants to go. One more reason that Aaron Rodgers might want to have his old friend back in town is the fact that Rodgers himself... A little bit beat up right now, and not surprisingly, because that game last week against the Broncos, which, by the way, when you are you get into your 40s, standing out there and playing football in the rain probably doesn't seem quite as fun as it might have uh, in your early 20s, Judy. He ends up with taking a several different hits. He's got some bumps and bruises. He has a knee that he said on the Pat McAfee show yesterday was a little bit swollen, actually popped up on the injury report, listed as limited. What do you make of that, especially because there's, you know, some things that may not be good for banged up joints like, oh, I don't know, across the Atlantic flight to London for a game this weekend? Well, my understanding is that he was listed as limited because he missed that early stretching portion of uh, the practice when the reporters were allowed to watch. As people may not realize this. Reporters are allowed to watch only a very small segment of practice in the regular season. Um, he was not on the field. He was back uh, in the training room. But then he came out on the field. And the understanding, as Robert Sala told reporters today, was he was going to practice fully. So it doesn't seem like he missed the practice. Certainly, there's, there doesn't seem to be any concern that he could miss the game. They're going to have to manage the injury. Um, and yeah, you know, a long flight to London probably doesn't help tomorrow. 
but they're going to have to manage this injury anyway. He is a 40-something quarterback. He got very banged up uh, last week. The offensive line did not hold up well. It really needs to hold up much better against Brian Flores' defense coming up on Sunday. Uh, but this is the kind of thing we're going to have to keep an eye on. I mean, this is the sort of thing that can linger. Clearly, he is going to play through practically anything at this point. Um, but, you know, it's certainly not the best situation for the Jets uh, who are coming off a very, very bad loss and who badly need to get back on track in London. 40 years, 305 days. Thank you, Pro Football Reference. That's always there if you need the uh, to the day age for somebody. December 2nd, that's how uh, Rogers turns 41. Uh, look, there's there's hurts, physical hurts, and then there's like emotional hurts or, 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 or feelings, Jaylen hurt hurts. feelings. Uh, there were Jalen Hurts, very good, Tom. Uh, <laughs> but so they're 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 managing the the physical part of it, and then the 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 feelings part of it. You remember that whole cadence thing after the game on Sunday? Robert Sala indicating maybe we should go away from the hard count, yesterday. and then Rogers being upset that he was asked about it, and Rogers downplaying it on the McAfee show. Well, today Robert Sala, like really, I, I, he he is. He's one of the calmer guys at press conferences and in interview. Like, he looked a little worked up today when I was watching that video. Uh, I don't think he was very happy about that. And and these two are trying to make it clear that they are on the same page. You're not going to tell Aaron I mean, you're going to tell Michael Jordan not to dunk. You're not going to tell Aaron Rodgers to not do a hard count. So they, they, they seem to have patched that one up. Then you got Garrett Wilson, who, by the way, was trying to clarify what he said on the radio that was kind of pulled, which I understand what he said. So there's a lot of like, oh, you guys are taking it out of context, but this team's got to start winning because this stuff's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, even if it's not necessarily all the way real. You know what Aaron Rodgers loves? He loves slights. <laughs> he loves to be like perturbed. Loves what? Kind of annoyed. Slights. You know, he likes when slights. people are like, ah, like slights. You know, he didn't play great. He got criticized. He got ripped by the press. You got the cadence gate. You know, you got all these things going on, and it sounds like Aaron Rodgers, is, <laughs> and his knee is banged up. Sounds like, I don't know, all right, anyway. Um, he's pretty ornery, and it sounds like at practice, he's even more ornery. And so Aaron Rodgers, I'd like to know what everybody's laughing at. I'm gonna, gonna come back to it. Uh, it does seem like Aaron Rodgers has taken a lot of this personally and would really like to unleash this all on the field on Sunday. And we have seen Aaron Rodgers on a revenge tour. We've seen him when he's annoyed at everyone, he's gonna, Put the football where the sun does not necessarily shine on a regular basis, as the saying goes. That is the Aaron Rodgers that I would expect to see on Sunday. Put this all together. Put it on the field. That's what we should see. I would also say it's always important to remember when you're watching Aaron Rodgers, he is a classic bad body language guy. It's something that coaches throughout his career have harped on him with. It's just who he is. He's going to have a different reaction when a route might be wrong, when he makes a bad pass, whatever it might be. I think that the fact that you now have him in New York and playing in front of that media group, that fan group, and playing in sloppy weather and not playing his best game. In other words, this can all cook to something that doesn't mean a whole lot if you go out and play well, but he'll have the whole country watching right here on NFL Network come Sunday early morning. Get up and watch it. The unbeaten Vikings against the Jets. Will you be able to watch Anthony Richardson play this week? Well, the Colts quarterback dealing with what I understand to be oblique strain and an abdominal strain. This was reported as a hip pointer. Bottom line, that whole side of his body doesn't feel great after he took a couple of hits last week against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Richardson listed as limited in practice today, and he's not ruling himself out just yet. Uh, still a little bit of soreness, but you know, we'll just see how I feel tomorrow. Coach said that you don't really need to practice to be able to play. I assume you agree with that give me your I mean, how important do you want to play this week against Jacksonville no, it's, it's definitely an you know, important game you know a divisional game and then going back to Florida you know that's my, my home state so I always wanting to play it down there but you know like coach said you know I don't have to necessarily practice to play so we're just taking it day by day just seeing how I'm feeling and seeing if I'm ready to you know, roll out there on Sunday you know we've been testing it you know uh, I worked out today so that, that was a plus um, definitely a lot of progress from yesterday you know yesterday was giving me a little bit of soreness but you know, I've been progressing day by day so we're just trying to see what it's going to be like the rest of the week I know you said the acceleration was one of the issues on Sunday have you noticed is that getting better uh, a little bit, you know, we, we haven't really tested out the acceleration again, you know, really just rotational and stuff, just making sure my, my legs are good. But, you know, just day by day, that's how we're taking it. 
Colts are at the Jaguars on Sunday. The Browns are at the Commanders. They're not going to have Nick Chubb just yet, but a great, great shot right there. Nick Chubb about 13 months after suffering that devastating leg injury last year against the Steelers on national TV. Officially returning to practice today. He's got 21 days now to ramp up. The Browns have taken a cautious approach. This was always the timeline, though. We'll see what version of Nick Chubb comes back onto the field, but the fact that he's out there at all, certainly great news. He is just one of many players who are eligible to be activated off the physically unable to perform list. Anybody who's on that list, non-football injury, injured reserve, all can come back starting week five. Odell Beckham Jr. is being activated. Clyde edwards Lair was officially activated. TJ Hawkinson with the team traveling to London. He's going to be activated in practice for the first time on Friday. Not going to play against the Jets, but could be back sooner than later. Marcus Mariota, backup quarterback in Washington, also officially back today. Also, some not so great news, Ian, on the injury front, specifically in New England, with a really key, if at times under talked about, cog in their offense. We don't spend a lot of time talking about centers on this show. We should, but we don't. When a season-ending injury occurs to maybe the most important Patriots player on the offense, it is something to talk about. David Andrews, sources say, suffered a shoulder injury that will require surgery. And I use the word very specifically, require surgery. Andrews expected to be out for the season, placed on IR. This is the guy who does the line calls. He is a locker room leader. He's a key cog in the organization. And he tried absolutely, literally everything to stay on the field and not have surgery. It was impossible. Surgery was the only option. Andrew's now out for the season. A lot more of the insiders to come before I get in my helicopter and head home. No, that's what Jerry Jones did today. Landed on the side field during practice. At any rate, Micah Parsons not practicing today. He is dealing with that high ankle sprain. That's not the only notable thing on the injury front, including a surprise with one of their receivers. Jane Slater will join us to help break that down next on The Insiders. I don't know about you, but this is how I would arrive at work if I, in fact, owned my own helicopter, if I owned a football team, if I owned uh, a facility like the Star that had enough space where you could land your helicopter next to the football team that you owned and that team being the Dallas Cowboys. Jerry Jones is living the life where he are just living in Jerry's world, and Jane Slater was there to see the landing of Jerry today at practice. Uh, Jane, maybe that was the only light moment at the Cowboys today because they got more bad injury news going into a very big Sunday night game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Take us through what happened with Brandon Cook's knee. Yeah, Judy, I wish I could say I was surprised by the helicopter, but I'm immune to it now. This is Dallas, if you're familiar with the soap <laughs> opera. The uh, the theme song plays in my head a lot when I'm out there. But, yes, this is yet another plot to uh, – the plot thickens, so to speak. You know, earlier this week we were talking about Demarcus Lawrence and Micah Parsons missing a few weeks. Now it's looking the same for star wide receiver Brandon Cooks. Now, he's the number two in Dallas, but to answer your question – It was described to me by a source informed that the right knee has been a bit of an issue for Cooks going all the way back to training camp. A source informed tells me he stayed behind in New York to get an injection in the knee. Now, what kind of injection? Unclear, but it was described to me as, quote, a common solution to avoid a scope for the meniscus. But when he returned to Dallas, he was dealing with an infection in the injection site. It was then that the team doctor, Dr. Dan Cooper, then scoped it to clean the infection and smooth out the meniscus issue. Now, I was told, quote, Brandon should feel great in one to three weeks. The Cowboys, if you look at the schedule, have two more games before the bye, Judy. They've got the Pittsburgh Steelers, then they've got the Lions, and then after that, they've got the bye before the 49ers. So we'll see how long this one plays out before we see him back out there on the football field. All right, they're very banged up uh, at a bunch of positions, but let's focus on the wide receiver room. What is the plan? Are they going to do anything to shore up that room? Well, it was really interesting. Before this Braden Cooks news came out, Judy, of course, there was all of this talk about Devontae Adams, possibly the Cowboys poking around on him. And then there's been Amari Cooper, who has been linked to possibly a return in Dallas. What I'm being told from 
everyone that I've spoken to, and people aren't going to like this, especially the fans, is, quote, we like our guys <laughs> and the guys on the practice squad. It's a sentiment that truly enrages the fans, but that's the reality. Up next, the two Jalens. You've got Jalen Tolbert, Jalen Brooks, Kevante Turpin, and Ryan Flournoy, who we saw in the preseason and who had a nice camp. Now, with the exception of Flournoy, who hasn't been activated yet, the group behind Lamb has a combined for 21 receptions, 267 yards, and two touchdowns. Jalen Tolbert is someone I specifically asked Dak Prescott about. This was a guy, if you'll remember, we talked about this in the draft two years ago. Mike McCarthy handed a list of wide receivers for Dak Prescott to call, see who really stood out to him, and Tolbert was one of those. I asked Dak, where has his game grown? And he said, everywhere. He said, Tolbert truly wants to be the number one, number two guy, and he could be, and he should be. So next man up mentality, here is your opportunity, uh, Jalen Tolbert. But again, going back to some of those rumors, look, the issue is, yes, the Cowboys do have cap money, 22 and a half million of it, but they want to use that money to, you know, keep in mind, They've got to figure out what to do with Micah Parsons after this season. They've also got a lot of dead money on expiring contracts to deal with. So the money is a little funny around in Dallas. And they keep telling us they don't have it, yet they went out and they got Dak Prescott signed. They got C.D. Lamb signed. So I know it's frustrating to a lot of people, but right now it sounds like they will not be making any moves to go out and acquire uh, any talent at the wide receiver position. All right, so thank you, Jane. We cleared that up. We can cross Dallas Cowboys off the Devontae Adams list, maybe at least for right now. Thank you, Jane. We will talk to you again. And when we come back, we're going to talk about maybe where Devontae Adams could go, some landing spots for the receiver teams that could make a trade for him, maybe should make a trade for him when we return on the Insiders. Top story for a second consecutive day in the NFL. Devontae Adams has told the team that he would prefer to be traded. Not expected to play this week as he deals with a very real hamstring injury. Should only be a week or two, but a hamstring injury nonetheless. As we bring you now, time for Inside Scoop. Presented by Accenture. Tom Pelissero joined on set here by Steve Weitz and also joined by Bucky Brooks. Bucky, I'll come to you first here. Devontae Adams has made fairly clear internally that he would like to be headed someplace else. We all can make the logical connection starting out with the New York Jets. Who do you view as the best fit for Devontae Adams? I think you talked about it right there. The New York Jets. And the reason why the Jets are a perfect fit is because the relationship that Devontae Adams has with Aaron Rodgers. We can talk about scheme. We can talk about coaches and those things. But the most important relationship for Devontae Adams is the quarterback. He went to the Raiders because he had a relationship with Derek Carr. He had a lot of success in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers. He naturally wants to have that kind of comfort. Even though this may have a little to do with money down the line and that stuff, he has to go to the Jets because the only person he's going to respect that quarterback is going to be Aaron Rodgers because Aaron Rodgers knows him best, knows how to keep him happy, knows how to give him the ball when he wants it. They're on a quest to win a Super Bowl. He's on a quest to be a legend. I think the only place for him to go are the New York Jets. Well, you think about comfort with a quarterback, Derek Carr, uh, down with the New Orleans Saints. I mean, he left to go to Las Vegas to play with Derek Carr. They're a team that absolutely could use him. You know, look, this is a team that if it works this year, get, by getting someone like Devontae Adams on that receiving core to go with Chris Olave and Taysom Hill and some of the other threats, then maybe they keep people around for another year. If it doesn't, maybe they disband the team. And Devontae Adams has a type of contract that you could go either way. As Tom explained earlier in the show, he's due $36 million each of the next two years, but it's not guaranteed. So you could rent him for a year, or you could blow the whole thing up, you know, if you rent it for a year, or you can restructure his deal and sign it for longer term if things do work. But I think the Saints, with a relationship with Derek Carr, getting back down there in that division in the NFC South that they could possibly win, I think that's an idea. It's Gardner Minshew, a quarterback right now for the Raiders. No signs right now at any point that this is going to change in the near term here. There is an alternate universe, Steve, where the Raiders find a way to trade up with number, to number two. Antonio Pierce gets reunited with Jaden Daniels. Maybe Devontae Adams feels differently about the situation. Correct. No offense to Gardner Minshew Correct. at this point. But you look at what Jaden Daniels 
has done through the first four weeks of his career. Some of the numbers are absolutely staggering, not to mention just the eye test, not just what he's doing with his legs, but even more so how he's playing from the pocket. Look at the numbers. Highest completion percentage in a four-game span since 1950. This isn't rookies. This isn't in the first four games. This is just highest completion percentage in a four-game span. Jaden above, well, two Hall of Famers and two guys who are going to be there soon enough. What more do you know about Jane Downs and why he's having a success? Well, look, I actually spoke to head coach Dan Quinn on Tuesday night, and he told me the thing that's most impressive about Jaden Daniels, you look at some of the numbers there. You look at the fact that the commanders are on top of the division, but he says the way he executes in pressure moments, that's something that he did not expect the rookie to do. He says when he's in two minute, third or fourth down, he gets into a mental space that's very obvious because he's smiling. He said he's not tight. He's reassuring to his teammates. He's like, Steve, he's absolutely chill. And he said in practice, they actually challenge him. Timeouts, when to clock it. And he says, the one thing you notice about Jaden Daniels is he can stay focused for a long time in a certain space, even when other players are getting bored. And then he says, now the fact that players have seen him do this time and time again in pressure situations, the trust they have in him is why they think he can sustain playing at such a high level, Bucky. You know, Weiss, it's funny that you say that about Jaden Daniels because the one thing that players love, they love having a quarterback on the roster that gives them hope. The defense changes when they have Jaden Daniels on the team because they believe if we get a stop and get the ball back, Jaden Daniels can win the game. Offensively, Scary Terry and some of the playmakers around him know if I run my route as hard as I can and get open, he is going to give me the ball. I will say this. Jaden Daniels is going to change the way that we evaluate quarterbacks at the collegiate level. Look, 54, 55 collegiate starts, a lot of experience, being able to jump right into the NFL and have a lot of success. The same thing happened with Brock Purdy in a different way. With Brock Purdy had 49 starts, there's something to the trend of these college players spending a lot of time at the collegiate level, having success and having immediate success in the pros. Jaden Daniels is the latest example. It's going to be a game changer when we come to the spring and start talking about the quarterbacks in the next class. Bucky, Steve, thank you very much. Always you good it, seeing you up here, Appreciate buddy. it, Tom. All right. When we return, uh, we got a guy who's a pretty versatile, pretty good player for a very good Houston Texans team. Jalen Petrie, what does he believe they have in store that they can throw at Josh Allen, maybe try to do the same thing to him in the Bills offense that the Raiders, Ravens did? the other day. We'll ask Dylan Petrie that and a lot more when he joins us right after this on The Insiders. Hey, great job, man. Hey, I talked about it last night. Whatever it takes, whoever it takes, however long it takes, finish with the win. And that's what we did today. We wanted to finish the first month of the season at 3-1, and one, and we did that. All right? Great job. Great job. Great job. We can be a really good team, really good team, if we all commit to doing the right things all the time, right? You see it, guy. We got to get out of our own way. Commit to doing the right things all the time, man, and how, see how good we can be when we get out of our own way. Y'all with me? Sure. All right, just a couple balls here, all right? Who you got? Dare, big time, man. Dare. Hey, great job, man. Great job. What a play. And we needed it most. We needed most great sure, job, and sure. I think he got the most yards yep. in the first four weeks of a season. Mm. Nico Collins! Great job, man. Keep ball to CJ again. Great job. Way to lead us. All right, offense, when we needed it most, guys. Way to go close it out. That's what we look like. That's how it should look every single time. Sure. Proud of y'all boys, man. Proud of you. Big win for the Texans last week. Big game this week against the Buffalo Bills. And who better to come on the insiders and talk about it than a guy who's one of the best young safeties in the NFL? Or should I call him one of the best young nickels in the NFL? One of the best young all-around DBs in the NFL. Jalen Petrie, you're everywhere, man. How are we living down there in Houston right now? Yeah, man, I'm having a lot of fun in Houston. We're doing a lot of different things. And, you know, I'm just enjoying every day and just trying to continue to stack these wins. 
Jalen, uh, at this time last year, like, nobody really knew what to expect of the Texans. You were still sort of sneaking up on the league. You're, you're not sneaking up on anybody this season, right? You're the favorites in the division now. How has it been different in the first month of the season to be the hunted instead of the hunter? Um, it has been a little bit different, you know. We, we definitely hear... Um, the chatter and the stuff through the media, but we try to keep the main thing the main thing and stay focused on the things that we need to stay focused on, which is um, honing into on the details and executing our job to the best of our ability. And I think uh, for the most part, we've done that in these last four games, but um, just trying to, you know, continue to get better. You, you heard D'Amico Ryans there talk about uh, going three and one over the first month of the season. Uh, and that kind of got me thinking about year two, because last year it was, you know, getting things off the ground. You guys wound up making the playoffs, uh, which I'm sure was always a goal of yours and an expectation of yours. But now it's like year two. How do we build on that? We better go 3-1, and one, if not 4-0, and oh, to start the season. So how has D'Amico taken you guys from year one to year two with raising those expectations? Um, I think it's just been about um, taking that next step every day, you know, in practice doing a little bit more, whether that's catching jugs, um, working on your footwork in terms of um, covering receivers. I'm um, just trying to do a little bit more than we did last year. And I think if we continue to do that on a daily basis, then it will continue to show um, when it comes to the end of the season. All right. So you got the Bills this week. Obviously, they're coming off a rough performance last weekend against the Ravens. That defense had a pretty good plan of attack. But this is the Texans. How do you get after Josh Allen and that Bills offense this week? Um, yeah, I think it's just about executing, making sure that we show him um, a couple different looks and not make him feel comfortable back there, but making sure that we're swarming to the ball wherever it ends up and make sure that we're making plays on the ball. I think if we do those three things, um, then, then we're going to be fine. Give us a snapshot of where you think the defense is right now because you're ranked fifth in the league. Uh, you're giving up points, but not a whole lot of yards. You're especially not giving up a whole lot of passing yards. Where do you think the defense is right now in its development? I think we're in a good spot. We're doing a good job at, um, you know, holding teams to not that much yards. But I think the biggest thing that we can focus on is making sure that we keep um, teams out of the end zone. And um, with that, I, like I said, it's just honing in on those details and making sure that we're focused on the right things um, when we do get in the red zone to make sure that um, other teams aren't scoring touchdowns. Today at practice, you had the return of one of your teammates, Dylan Horton, who was diagnosed uh, last December. He was out in November, but wasn't diagnosed until December uh, with stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma. Back today, he was in remission in the spring, completed his uh, treatment in the spring. What was it like for the team to see him back on the field today? Man, it was special. Um, Coach D'Amico talked about in our team meeting that um, today would open up his practice window and just having him back out there seeing all that he went through I'm um, the true word that he is it was just motivating all of us to see him push through and um, end up back out there on the field you know we're grateful to have him back and um, look forward to him coming off that edge for sure so Jalen I remember talking to you in training camp last year you were one of the first people to say listen the CJ Stroud guy you're like three days into camp you're like this he can be really, really good. You saw what he did throughout the course of his rookie season. You go against him, at least in training camp, again this year. Now you watch him on Sundays. What's the biggest difference if there is one C.J. Stroud year one to year two? Uh, that's a good question because, um, like you said, from day one, he's all, he's been a pro since then. I think um, me just being able to consistently see his consistency um, day in and day out and how he approaches the game is just second to none. I feel like... He's really honed in on what he needs to do to make sure this offense is going. And I think every week you see him, you know, show up at the same time, doing the same things, low-key eating the same things. Like, he's really <laughs> focused uh, when it comes to that. And um, I think that's what makes uh, the great ones great. So um, it's good, and it's great that I get to see him on a daily basis, and I'm glad that he's on my team for sure. Well, maybe related to that, Nico Collins is leading the league in receiving yards right now. Obviously, you, you see him in practice every day, too. What do you see from Nico that's allowed him to elevate his game so far this year? Yeah, he, he's a freak of nature. And um, I kind of want to say he's kind of quiet, but um, if you get to chirping at him, he, he's not letting nothing slide. And I think that shows in his game. He's very aggressive. You know, his releases are crazy. Um, his speed, it, it'll sneak up on you if you think – um, those long strides are moving too fast because um, I've seen it personally a lot in practice. Um, 
But overall, he's just a complete <laughs> receiver. He can do everything. His run after the catch is, is second to none. You know, he's trucking people. He's juking people. Like, he can take it over the top. He can take a slant for 50. Like, it's nothing that Nico can't do. So, uh, once again, I'm glad he's on my team. We've asked you about a bunch of players. Let's ask you about uh, another guy in the Texans. Jalen Petrie, let's ask you about yourself, okay? Uh, five interceptions as a rookie back in 2022. Still playing good football. I've always said interceptions are not a great indicator of how a guy is playing. But are you sitting there saying, give me a chance. I want to get a hand. I want to get my hands on the ball. I need that football again to get back to that feeling of a rookie of that ball just being a magnet to you. Nah, for sure. I definitely missed the ball. Um, had a little taste of it in uh, preseason, but um, I'm definitely trying to get back to that. I think I need to just, you know, continue to, um, like I said, hone in on the details, perfect my assignment, and, and the ball is going to come to me for sure. But, um, yeah, I definitely miss it. Jalen, I also know you do a lot of stuff off the field. Your Feed 5 More campaign, one of the coolest ones that we've seen in the community. Tell me what you're doing now uh, going into another year of this. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to, like I said, do a little bit more than I did last year. This year, I want to raise 55, over 55,000, um, 55,000 meals um, to help out the kids in the Houston area. And um, one way that I'm doing that in these next couple of weeks is I'm giving um, away two tickets to anybody that uh, follows the directions on my Instagram to the, to the Colts game coming up. So, you know, I'm trying to do as much as I can in the community to help those out in need. And, um, yeah, this is the way that I'm doing it. Awesome stuff, Jalen. Keep up the good work on and off the field. We'll definitely see you on the field this Sunday, man. Good luck. Yeah, appreciate y'all having me. Coming up after this, Michael F. Florio's got some thoughts on some players who might have had a breakout week in week four and whether you should keep them in your fantasy lineup in week five. Is Deontay Johnson one of those guys? Even though he didn't practice today because of an ankle, Florio's got answers for you next on The Insiders. Did you have the perfect lineup last week in fantasy? I bet you didn't because it would have looked like this. This would have been a difficult, though not impossible, draft to pull off and get all these players on your team. Derrick Henry, of course, had the monster game. Kenneth Walker III, also a triumphant return to action. And Nico Collins, the best receiver that you don't talk about among the best receivers in the NFL, continues to produce. Time now to go inside with NFL Fantasy Live here on The Insiders. Tom Pellicero, Mike Garofolo, Ian Rappaport, joined by our buddy Michael F. Florio. Michael F., let's play a little game right now called Believe It or Not. It would be a bad game if we were playing with Ian because he'll believe basically anything. But for you, I posit this question. There were some quarterbacks who maybe people weren't expecting to have big weeks in week four. Start up by telling me, do we believe Justin Fields could be a fantasy stud again going into week five? Yeah, I think he can be. I believe in Justin Fields because – we have known he is a good fantasy quarterback since he stepped on the field. Is he a good real life quarterback? That is still being determined, but he runs and that is all we care about in fantasy football. And he is starting to get comfortable in Pittsburgh right now. He is developing chemistry with George Pickens, but uh, the running again is all we care about. Over 50 rushing yards in half his games, three rushing touchdowns in the last two weeks. You got to be excited about that in fantasy. And then I believe in Jared Goff. Look, he did it last season. He is not going to catch a touchdown every single week, but he is going to throw for plenty of them. He is surrounded by elite weapons, uh, and he has only three outdoor games the rest of the fantasy season. And we know that when he is indoors, he puts up numbers. So I believe in, uh, in Jared Goff moving forward. All right, how about this one then? Kareem Hunt made his re-debut with the Kansas City Chiefs uh, this past Sunday. 69 yards, pretty nice performance by Hunt. Can we... Wait. Yeah! <laughs> look at that shirt. Florio, you look amazing. You look so much better than the other people on this uh, on this panel. Really I was waiting to see if so you were going to catch it. these idiots. Well, I usually <laughs> you look at the camera, attention. not the person, but you look great. Anyway... Let's go uh, Mets. Can I can I believe in Kareem Hunt going forward? I 
personally don't believe in hunt right now i know there's people out there who do and look he is the lead back for the kansas city chiefs so if you're in a pinch or something like that you could go and get him into your lineup but uh last week samaj p ryan played just a few snaps less than hunt did and he vultured a touchdown and p ryan is obviously going to be in on passing downs plus is Carson Steele fully out of the picture? CEH can return uh, at any point now. So I think it might be a committee with Hunt as the lead, but still a committee until Pacheco eventually returns. And then Jeremy McNichols. I I'm not a believer. I know he had a huge game this week. Half of his career touchdowns were scored in it. This was painful for me and Mike to watch because that should have been Austin Eckler out there in this great matchup, just eating. But Eckler could be back as soon as this week. And once he is back, I expect his backfield to once again operate between him and Brian Robinson Jr. So I'm not chasing the points when it comes to Jeremy McNichols. Changing the things on my bookshelf. Uh, here, what'd you drop over there, Mike? We heard a little plinko there. A little bit too <laughs> tight. I'm trying to put this oh, on the show. There we go. Game. See, you got to put it right here. Oh, put it on my head? Well, I could put this one on my head or I could just, I mean, he started it, so we're just going to come. <laughs> Run out of time, Mike. Finish it. Let's go. Uh, wide receivers. The thing, with, with the thing with the Where wide receivers. Uh, Deontay Johnson. Yeah, I, I believe in Deontay. Uh, I'm rooting against your Phillies, Mike, but I believe in Deontay. I was pounding the table for him all summer long, and there's no way I am backing away now. Two games with Andy Dalton. He has 27 targets, 313 air yards, and six end zone targets. It is elite volume. He is top 21 fantasy points in each of them. No way am I shying away. And then Dontavian Wicks is another wide receiver that I believe in. Last week, 13 targets, 210 air yards, three end zone targets. That is elite volume. And we've seen him eat in the past when giving a chance. Three career games with over 70% snaps played. In those, he has 236 yards and three touchdowns. Plus, he's tied to a good offense and a good quarterback. So I am plugging in Wicks in a lot of lineups this week. Don't set your fantasy lineups without listening to Michael F. Florio, who you can hear a lot more from yeah, and Fan NFL Fantasy policy. Live, 5 p.m. Eastern time on, 30, on Thursday. Florio, thank you, as always, for joining the show. Okay, coming up after this, let's cook up a little dinner, shall we? Or maybe we should let Sauce Gardner cook it up with some tips from our guy, Ian. We'll explain after this on the inside. Not many more entertaining or prolific follows on the platform formerly known as Twitter than Sauce Gardner. The last night was asking, hey, what's the best charcoal grill? Then followed that up talking about, man, it hits way harder than food on an electric grill. All of that, and apparently then he was swayed to a Traeger Ironwood XL electric pellet grill. Word on the street is that wood pellet grills are better yeah. than charcoal grills. Yeah. Some people are impressionable with their grilling. Not well, our guy, Ian Rapport. You got 20 seconds to break down going. this purchase, Ian. Uh, great purchase. I say the same thing. I'm currently smoking a 15-pound Wagyu brisket uh, on my Traeger right now. He's right. Charcoal grills hit different. But that, yeah, that's the pastrami that I smoked. That was also a brisket that we turned into a pastrami with my buddy Ben. Look how beautiful that is. I'm also, I mean, we don't have, oh, that was the Zahav The best part we, is you were doing this we at like 3 p.m. on a Sunday, as if nothing else was happening. Well, yeah. We'll see ya.